Head of Engineering and Built Environment at Griffith University, Professor Rosalind Archer is an energy sector expert, energy engineer, and director of the Geothermal Institute. Professor Archer is interested in the power of energy solutions to improve lives and believes that both engineering and education can make transformative changes for students, society and the economy. It's my pleasure to be here tonight with everyone. And I too would like to echo the acknowledgement of country, the acknowledgement of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. For those of us who are in Australia, I can see there's definitely some folks based internationally, but that sense of um, custodianship and respect for elders, past, present and future is an incredibly important concept in many, many indigenous communities that have access to geothermal resource. Um, so I really wanted to begin with that sentiment. So I'm here to offer um, some thoughts on geothermal energy and in particular the way that it empowers women and communities around the world. I'll give you a bit of a world tour um, to give you a sense of how that plays out in multiple continents. Uh, but first I would like to acknowledge uh, that I am relatively new in Australia. I've been living here for um, really since uh, January and have joined Griffith University from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where I still hold an honorary academic position. So back in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, I was the director of the Geothermal Institute and I um, still have many valued friends, students and collaborators there. And much of what I'm presenting is, is built on ideas that were worked up in my time at the University of Auckland. So I will start with a little bit of technical content, uh, but I'm not going to stay too technical for too long. Um, so just an introduction to what geothermal energy is, if you're not familiar with it. It's essentially energy from the earth. Uh, so it's bringing thermal energy, heat, uh, from underground in the form of hot water or steam. So that heat is offered um, from the processes in the core of the earth. In particular, there are some regions that are anomalously hot underground. So they have layers underground that may be saturated with either hot water, hot brine or steam. And we drill into those to access it. In, in many ways using the same sorts of technology as oil and gas for the drilling. There are definitely some technical differences, but uh, the oil and gas industry is um, really looking at um, pivoting uh, into using more and more of their ideas in geothermal. So as the figure on screen elaborates, we, we drill for these hot um, fluids. We extract steam. So if the fluids come up as liquid, that liquid is depressurized to um, get it into a steam. The steam is passed through a steam turbine, spins a generator to generate electricity. Then whatever comes off the back of the turbine is cooled and usually re-injected in modern geothermal underground to maintain um, ideally pressures and temperatures underground. And there's a lot of science to exactly how much do you extract? Where do you position your reinjection to make sure that this is truly sustainable? Because if, it, if the wells are not planned and operated well, it does become extractive and not sustainable. So much of the work my former team um, at the University of Auckland worked on was thinking about advanced mathematical modeling to look at that sustainability question. The energy that comes out, uh, one question the industry faces is, is it carbon neutral? Uh, because the fluid from underground often has a dissolved carbon dioxide content and some of that carbon dioxide can uh, be released through the electricity generation process. So it is not necessarily carbon zero, but in most geothermal fields, not all, um, it is significantly cleaner than fossil fuels by um, you know, orders, orders of magnitude, but there are definitely exceptions. And there's a whole um, science to, you know, how that can be um, mitigated and how geothermal plants could actually be used to store carbon dioxide underground. And in a more science-driven talk, I would go there. 
So where do we find geothermal in the world? So there's this 2019 data, but it's still fairly current. Uh, Australia is in the grey there, indicating that there's no significant geothermal in Australia. There is one small producing plant that came on in 2019, but it is very small by, by global standards. Um, however, there is quite an interest from a range of startups in Australia at potential projects in New Zealand. But you'll see that where geothermal flourishes is around um, what's called the Ring of Fire in Asia, where you have tectonic plate boundaries, which are causing geological processes in the earth that give you these anomalously high heat flows, typically places which are volcanic. Um, so New Zealand has boiling mud, it has geysers, it has volcanoes. Uh, so do parts of Asia, you'll see the Philippines, um, Indonesia, for instance, highlighted. The ring of fire goes up through Japan, and then you also get geothermal down the other side of the Pacific, California, Mexico, for example. You have um, a region in East Africa, uh, Kenya in particular has significant geothermal, and then you have projects coming on in, in Europe, slightly different geolo geological conditions, and then Iceland is a very significant geothermal player. Uh, they have classic geothermal with a lot of volcanism. But really the thrust of my talk is to talk uh, in terms of the SDGs and how this rather unique energy source, this renewable energy source empowers women and communities. So first I wanna highlight a global initiative, a truly wonderful global organization called WING, Women in Geothermal. And it is a grassroots network of women with an interest in the sector. No, actually, I correct myself there. Women and men with an interest in empowering women. So one of WING's um, mandates is they actually want 50% of their um, membership to be male. They want men as allies on this journey to professional empowerment. So WING uh, was formed essentially through groups of women in both the US and New Zealand thinking something needed to happen, getting together at a conference in the US uh, and sharing those ideas, kicking it off. New Zealand was WING's global headquarters for the first um, six or seven years of its life. Uh, it's now passed that bit on to the US. And it went globally pretty much right away. So it has local chapters in a huge number of geothermal countries where they are building local networks to empower um, female geothermal professionals. They're making very extensive use of social media. So there are communities that you can access round the clock in whatever your local language is to ask for advice, support, technical guidance, mentoring. If you go to a conference in the geothermal sector, you will proudly see delegates, male and female, wearing lapel pins for this organization to say, hey, they support women in the sector. Heaps of men wear these badges with pride. Um, most of the major geothermal conferences will offer this group dedicated space for an exhibition booth, a slot in the program to really give women and the work they do profile. So they are an absolutely amazing organization. They have corporate support. There are companies that want to get on board and support things like scholarships to get women to technical conferences, for example. There is also a very fascinating branch of WING called the Wingman Special Task Force. And this was a project that started in New Zealand with a group of really awesome men who wanted to be allies, who wanted to understand how they could help empower women uh, to be advocates. And this task force has worked through with the guys the importance of language, of unconscious bias, of understanding the journeys of um, combining family and professional life, um, thinking through things like safety. You know, what does it mean when you turn up to work and all the safety gear is, you know, nowhere near your size because you're uh, a petite female? What, how does court? corporate culture play out. So these guys got together and really thought this through and um, have become global champions for how men can be part of the equation. And some of the realizations they had along the way were fascinating. You know, I remember going to a meeting one time and one of them came up to me and said, hey, 
I never know what it's like to be you. You're usually the only female in a meeting. I went to a meeting the other day and I was the only guy in the room. Gee, it felt weird. It's like, welcome to my world. That, <laughs> that's daily life for me. Um, so they share some of their recollections. If you want to know more about WING, then check out uh, the resources that I have on screen to access uh, their sites um, in terms of their main website and a paper they've put together on the work that they do. I'll now take you through to El Salvador. El Salvador's National Geothermal Company has a workforce that is 30% female, which is outstanding. And they have been a real powerhouse in thinking about how they can make life better for their female employees how they can recruit more female employees, thinking through what are the structural barriers. You know, these sites are often in remote locations. So they've done things like offer women driving lessons to help them get to work, help, um, you know, set up uh, daycare programs. They've also helped really think through the economic impact of how geothermal energy can empower surrounding communities. So in terms of... Um, spurring other employment. So using excess geothermal um, fluid for drying fruit for agricultural pro projects, uh, employing women in the community uh, for wildlife protection areas that may be around um, the geothermal plant. And they have become a real leader. So they had a branch of the Wingman Special Task Force uh, who had some aid funding to go to El Salvador and really talk um, to these guys about how they could become allies. So there are outstanding male champions for women in the geothermal sector in El Salvador. I also want to touch briefly on life in Kenya. Uh, so I had the privilege of traveling in East Africa um, with the New Zealand Aid Programme where um, you can really see the impact of what access to energy means. So the graph I have on screen is plotting out human development index against energy consumption. And you see a correlation. The better access you have to energy, stereotypically, the better your life is. Keeping the lights on mean women um, you know, have a very different home life in terms of um, education for children, what you can do in the evenings, how you cook, you know, daily life becomes transformed. So Kenya is on um, a trajectory to really ramp up electrification and they also have geothermal resource. So one thing that Kenya is doing very, very well is using that geothermal resource to spur other industries. So the example I have on screen is from a company called Osirian. And when I traveled in Kenya, next to the geothermal plants, you see acres and acres of greenhouses. And one of the challenges of growing um, in greenhouses in Kenya is even though we think of Kenya as, as African, as a warm country, at elevation, it gets cold in the evening. It gets plenty cold in the evening. So they use spare geothermal um, fluid that has gone through the power plants to help heat uh, greenhouses. Their greenhouses grow some of the most magnificent roses in the world. They ship them to the L London direct from Kenya, all uh, labeled with Marks and Spencer and the right supermarket logos. And it has become a huge source of employment for local women. And then the company is reinvesting in the local community. So the example there I have is around the construction of a maternity hospital. So they, um, you know, that hospital has delivered 14,000 babies in much better conditions than ever before in the area. So huge flow on effect around what they're doing at the plant. I'm taking now to Iceland. And Iceland is, of course, a, a developed country, a highly developed country. They are also one of the um, largest ge geothermal generators in the world. And they play quite a significant role in the geothermal sector. Um, as does New Zealand in terms of trying to empower geothermal development in other countries. So they bring a huge amount to the world. But one thing I want to showcase is that the United Nations University um, is based in Iceland in this sector. And they have worked with um, various agencies in Iceland to gain funding to make a documentary called Full Steam Ahead which is a, a, an ethnographic documentary 
comparing and contrasting um, the journeys of female geothermal professionals in Africa to Iceland. This was meant to premiere at our global geothermal conference in Iceland, which was due to happen during COVID. So things have um, been put on ice, so to speak. But the documentary is an amazing piece of work. I, I um, have met, met the film crew when they were filming in New Zealand, and it really creates an, an incredible sense of global community. So those of us with resource, you know, there was some crowdfunding needed for post-production. So those of us with the financial resources to do it have all put in money to try and make this documentary really come to life. Locally in Iceland, um, they are known for being um, one of the most uh, feminist countries, shall we say, in the world. Uh, they have very progressive communities and legislation, but they um, really continue to push the bounds and want to do more. So they were one of the earliest um, sort of adopters of leaning into the question of a gender pay gap. So Reykjavik Energy in 2011 uh, was thinking strategically, thinking about investing in the future and investing in their people. So they, you know, this is over 10 years ago, did studies on what the gender pay gap was in their company, decided they wanted to eliminate that gender pay gap by really paying women what they're worth in comparison to men in the same roles. They resolved the gender pay gap over um, five years. They got to gender balance in um, management teams and may or may not be a coincidence, but they um, found an incredible increase in employee job satisfaction. So people are happy to work at Reykjavik Energy, happier than the industry standard. So if you're in an environment where recruiting talent is key, leaning into these kind of gender-based questions is important. And that war on talent in terms of recruiting the best people is very, very important these days. I'll now quickly take you to Indonesia. And Indonesia is a country that is very close to my heart. In life pre-COVID, I used to be there often. And during our first lockdown, I invested time on Duolingo, working on language lessons in, in Bahasa in the hope of getting back to Indonesia. So they have very substantial geothermal resources. And one thing that geothermal plants need is they do need access to some land. And in communities where, um, you know, title for land um, isn't, um, you know, handled in um, the same systems that Western communities have, you often have to think through impacts on local communities. How do you relocate people? How do you spur industry there? Um, in this example I have on slide, um, I have a scene from some coffee farming in matrilineal villages. So villages where, um, you know, women um, are in many senses quite powerful in terms of the way assets flow. Um, but the local geothermal company needed um, access to some land in that area and really worked with the local community to help empower their um, coffee growing efforts by using their um, networks. There's also scope to use geothermal energy to dry coffee beans um, to avoid um, using biomass or other solutions. Uh, the New Zealand Aid Programme has been active in Indonesia, really catalyzing support for um, that networking, mentoring, technical empower empowerment piece. So there's been a very successful program led by New Zealand um, in Indonesia to get female geothermal professionals um, networked and collaborating and really create that sort of virtuous circle that women enter the industry, they stay in the industry, so they don't bail out after three or four years because they find it uncomfortable, and they move into um, leadership roles, hopefully. And then acting as role models to support other women to follow that pathway. Um, so that wraps up really a, a very quick uh, world tour. I was um, conscious of, of time and want to maximize time for questions. But I really would welcome um, questions and comments either in this forum or later online. Um, I'm easy to find online, um, social media, especially on LinkedIn. And if you want to read in depth on any of more of this material, 
I've referenced here a few more substantive reports um, that consider gender issues in the geothermal industry in different parts of the world in more detail. So I think I'll wrap it up there and um, I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you.